As vehicles become increasingly more complex, ADOS calibrations are a huge opportunity for your shop. But where do you start? The most important first step is finding the right partner. When you work with Aztec, you get a true partner, dedicated to providing your business with the right tools, technology, and training you'll need to perform all dynamic and static calibrations. Aztec is the trusted calibrations partner for hundreds of businesses across the U.S. and Canada. They will build a customized roadmap for your shop to bring all calibrations in-house. Hey there, it's Jason Stahl with another episode of Under the Radar. And today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Repairify. Today I have a very special guest. His name is Kurt Fenzel. He is the ADAS and EV instructor, specialty training for ICAR. Welcome, Kurt. Hi, it's great. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You're welcome, Kurt. And you know what? Believe it or not, I think you're the fourth guest from ICAR we've had on the podcast. That's great. So I wanted to mention you're a teacher, you're an instructor, and interestingly, when I was in college, I thought about being an elementary school teacher, and I was studying elementary ed. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty much just have my summers off to play golf. Not a great reason to be a teacher. <laughs> but I understand that teachers, whether you're teaching adults or children, need an immense amount of patience. So I congratulate you on that. But that kind of leads into my first question. What is the number one misconception you've seen from collision technicians coming in and taking your course? I think anybody that, that comes in to take a course is sometimes leery of, you know, how much they're going to learn. And, you know, depending on their level of knowledge, you know, we've all had trainings where someone just kind of stands there and reads and reads and reads and does everything by the script. But uh, the, the nice thing about the, the courses that we teach here is they're hands on. They've done all the prereqs before they come in. So we're just doing the hands-on skill development. We're not doing uh, a lot with PowerPoints. We'll do a review just to make sure everybody's on the same page. And if they have any questions from any of those prereqs, when they come in and see us, we're doing all hands-on skills. So I think sometimes they, even though it's in our title of what we're doing is hands-on, I think sometimes they think that they're just going to be sitting there and not really doing any of sort of calibrations or any hands-on but from pretty much from the moment they get there, they're on the cars, they're, you know, they're doing these calibrations, they're using the tools and, um, you know, we're problem solving for their if, if, if need be. So are they excited when they find out it is hands on and it's not just a lecture? Yeah, um, I'm really big. Like, I don't I don't like using classrooms. So when I started here, I kind of pushed the tables into the labs and our, our, we have a big TV that we use, you know, for any of the pictures or presentations we need. But I I pushed all that stuff in the lab and I just said, well, everything we're doing is in the lab. I don't need a classroom space. So I, I when they walk in and they see everything is in the lab and we're all we're right back next to the cars, I think immediately they like, oh, well, we're going to be learning in here. I'm like, well, yeah, everything we're doing is in here on the vehicle. So there's no need to, to be in a separate room for that. So I, I believe that environment and just how we have the environment set up here uh, helps from the get go, getting them excited to see what we're doing. Kurt, what is the official name of the course and what is the description of the course? So we have two courses. We have a static ADAS calibration class where in that class they're coming in and they're doing, um, they're setting up the grids and the, and the targets and, and doing static calibrations, which are all done basically inside of a building. There may be some type of calibration where you'd have to take the vehicle out and drive it. We're solely focusing on having them do those calibrations um, and following the OEM information where they're placing out the grid on the ground, placing the target correctly and, and performing the calibration. So that, that particular class is all setting up targets and, and following OEM service information and making sure that that stuff is, is done correctly and then executing the calibration through the, the scan tool. We also have a, a dynamic uh, ADAS class and in that class, since it's dynamic and the vehicle needs to be driven for the calibration, that class is set up as, as a diagnostic class. So when you go to, you know, do a calibration, something, you know, there's some type of issue with the vehicle, whether it be from the accident, something maybe from the repair that wasn't completed um, or an issue with a part, we go through and we're, we're able to bug all those vehicles. Um, and we have um, about 80 different bugs we can do on four different vehicles and some other things we can kind of pull out of our sleeves if necessary, just to help walk the, the technicians through those, those problem areas. Are these 
technicians coming in with zero knowledge? Are they coming in with a little bit of knowledge? Are they coming in fairly well experienced with ADOS or is it all across the board? That was something I was was really interested in knowing about when I when I came in here to start training. And um, I kind of thought it was going to be a lot of, you know, 20, 30 year master techs coming in with tons and tons of experience. You know, I'm a younger guy, so I'm like, oh, these guys are going to have, you know, 30 years experience on me. They're going to be 45 year people, but they're all over the board. They're, um, you know, they're people fresh out of high school um, that have been doing ADAS calibrations for a few months and they're, and they're just getting their feet wet and we're, 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 we're covering the basics with them from the ground up. Um, I just had a, a, a class here two weeks ago, I think, and the, the person was a, a 30 year master tech had been working on cars his whole life and uh, wanted to do something that was a little less um, underneath the vehicle with his back hunched over and, and, and hard on his body. So now he's managing uh, ADAS calibration technicians. So it's it's all over the board. It's, it's people that have just started doing calibrations. It's people that have been working on cars for a long time. It's people, some of these people have been doing ADAS calibrations for 15, 20 years. They're, they're some of the, you know, first people that have gotten their hands on this stuff way at the beginning when we started seeing uh, ADAS incorporated on vehicles. And, um, you know, nowadays it's pretty mainstream. We're seeing it on a lot of vehicles. So there's, there's so many people involved with it. Uh, some of the people are, they're just, they're collision technicians that just want to know what, what's going on with these uh, these systems and learn a little bit more about them as they're working on the vehicles and repairing them. So it's all across the board. Are, are they also, like, what, are, what is their occupation? Are they, are they collision technicians? Are they painters who want to do this work? Are they yeah. estimators who want to transition to this work? Are they the owner or the manager of the shop? Who are these, what are the, what are the roles they are currently in? Again, it's another all the above. We see training managers come through that want to have a better understanding of what their technicians are doing. Their ADAS calibration technicians that, again, they could be, you know, just a couple months in, they could be 15 years in. Some of them are, are, are collision technicians. Some of them are, are just general managers. It's, it's again, it's, it's all over the board. We're seeing many different people come in. I think some people, they don't want to come in and take the training and, and maybe just kind of make sure that our training is legit. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll send a manager through and, and have them experience it. And then, you know, when they see that what we're doing is truly hands on and we're, you know, we're following uh, OEM procedure, they'll, they'll send their, their technicians through. But, yeah, it's it is it's all over the board, which is nice as a, an instructor to have people at, at, at different levels and different backgrounds. Um, everybody brings something to the table. Uh, and that's always something that I like to, to hammer in right, right at the beginning of class, that there's always something to learn. In this industry, everybody's got something to share. Everybody's got something that they can bring to the table and, and, and help someone uh, learn or, or be better at their job. You know, at, at a time especially where we're struggling to keep technicians um, in, in the field, let alone get them to come in the field, we can't be keeping secrets. There's, there, there's no secrets to keep. Everybody, everybody's got something to share. So I always like to hammer that home that it doesn't matter if you're someone that's been doing these calibrations for 20 years, 15 years, whatever the case may be, uh, everybody's got something to bring to the table and uh, everybody should learn something by the time they leave. And uh, generally people are pretty good about, you know, opening up that nudge and experience. What is the biggest misconception these students have with advanced driver assistance systems when they come to your class or maybe put a different way, what is the thing that most surprises them about this technology? There's a couple. It, it depends on, on, the, on, on the person doing the calibration, but there's sometimes a misconception that there's a one tool that fits every scenario. Um, obviously here we're, you know, we're, we're using OEM targets and OEM tools, and we want them to, to, to make sure that they, they know how to use and, and understand that. Um, there is not a one size fits all tool. Um, I do sometimes think they they don't think it's as sophisticated as they do. Um, you know, these systems are, are very trusting of what we're doing and that we're doing it correctly when we're calibrating them. So as sophisticated as these systems are, where, you know, they may be giving us a warning signal or keeping us in our lane or, or as advanced as braking the car and even steering the car, there is a lot of trust on our side of it, the technician side, that we're doing these calibrations correctly. We're placing these targets exactly where they're supposed to be placed. We're driving them the way they're supposed to be driven if we're doing a dynamic calibration. So I think they're a little surprised when they see how easy it is to, to miss something in a diagnosis if there's an issue or to inadvertently place a target in the wrong spot and then 
there, therefore calibrate the, the vehicle. The vehicle doesn't always know that that's, that's the case. It's trusting that what we're doing on our end is what the manufacturers intended us to do. And I think even if you have a technician that is new or someone, again, that's been doing it for a long time, it's always a good thing for them to see like, oh man, I, I shoot, like we could have, we could have, you know, maybe put somebody in harm if we had not done that correctly. So it's really important that, uh, again, we're, we're following all that stuff to a T and I, th that I believe is the misconception. I think, yes, these systems are very smart, but they're also very trusting that, like I said, on our side that we're doing it correctly. Kurt, do these class attendees understand the importance of ADOS when it comes to the safety of the driver? You know, it's steering you, it's braking you, yeah. it's telling you about cars in your blind spot. Or do they understand the gravity of the situation in, in returning these systems to to precise operating condition? I believe so. You know, I, I always like to use the same thing that I've used for years. You know, it's it's as simple as putting a wheel on a vehicle. You know, when we put a wheel on a vehicle, we take that wheel off and we put that wheel back on. We're not just taking the impact gun and, you know, doing the ugga we're, we're We're torquing those wheels back onto the vehicle. And, you know, that's it's a simple task. That's a, it's a basic task that a, an early technician will do, and, and we do it from there on forth. Um, but if someone doesn't do that, you know, there's always a potential that something could happen and it could be super catastrophic. So um, I always like to bring up the point, like, we always want to return these vehicles as if it's our own family going to be in there and our own families are on the road next to these vehicles. So uh, I, I, I do believe that everybody does understand that, but I, I always like to bring that point up and just say, we're returning these vehicles back to families that are going to be around our families and it could be our family. And, you know, we always want to, we always think that when we're getting our vehicle back, if we're, if we're giving it to somebody else to do something that it's been done exactly how it's supposed to be um, in terms of the repair or the calibration. Uh, but overall, generally, people have a pretty good understanding, and they take it very serious. Uh, like you said, like these these vehicles are are, are are basically taking some type of control away from us in some cases, where they're auto steering or auto braking. You know, we're we're moving towards that autonomy, and um, you know that's that that's physically taking over our driving and um, putting the safety of our our occupants in in the vehicle's hands at that point. Kurt, what is the biggest mistake you see when the students are using a scan tool and also the biggest mistake you see when they are calibrating a vehicle? Honestly, the number one mistake that I see in terms of the calibration is reading through service information um, correctly. Sometimes they'll miss, you know, a step, they'll misread a measurement. Depending on the manufacturer, you know, they might have multiple different models or variations of models in, in their um, specifications in the service info. And we'll see sometimes students just misread that um, or, or skim over something or maybe even be in the wrong section entirely. Um, so just reading and interpreting service information and just taking their time and reading it correctly. In terms of the scan tool, Sometimes there's just connectivity issues. You know, we're relying on you know manufacturers, servers now, and, and internet to connect to these vehicles. Uh, we have gateways now that we got to use to get into these vehicles. Sometimes to perform calibrations. So sometimes it's as simple as a car in in a scan tool just not wanting to talk to each other. And and how do we troubleshoot that and, and, and resolve that? Sometimes you know we'll be in a class. You know we're using actual OEM tools and targets. So if there's an issue on the manufacturer side or you know our internet provider side. It's all real-time issues that that we have to work through, and uh, but th those are the two most common. You know, the, the you know reading and interpreting service info correctly, and uh, sometimes some connectivity issues getting the scan tools to talk with vehicles. What are some of the more common questions you you get from students taking these classes? Um, I would say one of the most common questions we get, kind of back to that one size fits all. You know, is there one tool that we can use? calibrate all these vehicles what's the one tool that i need what's the what's the what's the one you know scan tool that i need and you know uh, there isn't you know you need to use the oem service information you need to use the oem targets and you need to use the oem scan tool they're the ones that are designing the cars they're the ones that you know have set up these procedures and created these targets and developed these 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 adas systems so they're the ones that have have developed all this stuff so 
our stand, Sidecar stands, is that we're gonna we're gonna follow the OEM procedure, the OEM tools that they have specified in the service information, and we're gonna use the OEM scan tool to perform those calibrations. So if that question ever comes up, it's you know, unless it's it's a tool that's been approved by the OEM, we're using whatever the OEM tells us that we're supposed to be using. There's this there's there's too much room for error on that other side. What do the students get upon the successful completion of the courses? Do they get a, uh, a, a title? Do they get a certificate? Do they get a status that they can end, add to the end of their name? Well, what do they get from this? It, it depends on uh, what they're working towards, but right now uh, ICAR has developed an ADAS technician role, so they might be working towards different levels of that technician role. Um, some, some people that have taken the class, I don't know that they even care about that status. They just want to go through the class and, and be better at it. It just, it just depends. Um, there's, there's, different, there's different variations that you can do when you, when you've, as you've gone through the class. Uh, it just depends on what, what, what that specific person is, is, looking, is looking to gain. Um, but ICARD, like I said, has developed a, an ADAS technician role now. So we do have a lot of people coming through that are trying to uh, go through that and, and, and get, a, get to their different levels of that role. Uh, we do have people that are, are new to the industry and, you know, they're just looking for some some training to, to just kind of a, a better starting point or maybe even correct some areas where they're struggling with. Uh, it just depends on, on what they're looking to get. But at the end of the class, they do they do indeed get a certification and uh, they're able to take that just like any other one. And, uh, you know, in the industry or ICAR offers and they're able to present that and, and use that as kind of part of their portfolio. Chris, what do they say at the end of the class to you? Do they say, boy, I was really surprised to learn this, or I feel like I can calibrate any vehicle on the planet now? I mean, what feedback do you get at the end of the class? Uh, are they really happy that the, and that the class was taught them what they needed to know and it was very thorough? What do they say? Yeah, generally they're they're pretty happy. You know, we always we're, we're very open to feedback and, and and constructive criticism. Like we're you know we're we're instructors. We're we're used to people having feedback or ideas, and and, and truthfully, like we we use those ideas to make what we're doing better. We we can present the information better. We can work through different problem areas better. Generally, you know, the thing that that I that I love hearing is especially when we have those technicians that have been in the role for a long time, whether. ADAS or just in general, they've been in the role for a long time. They've been in the industry for a while. It's always really good to hear that, oh, you know, I, I got a lot out of this class. I didn't think I was going to come in and learn anything. And there's there's always, there's always like I said, there's always room for growth. And we established that at the beginning that, you know, we all got room to grow and we all have, we all have something to give. And at the end of the class, there's, we always get that really positive feedback. Um, you know, really good. The, the, one of the best compliments we get is when, like I had mentioned, if we have a manager come through and then we'll see a month or two later that all of a sudden their technicians coming through. They'll say, hey, we're sending our technician through to come do that. I'm like that that to me is, is one of the best compliments we can get when, you know, they they will we'll send a manager through, a company will send a manager through. And, and uh, you know, a little while later, we'll see some of their technicians come through because obviously they, you know, they, they must think we're doing something right. So you mentioned the, the two courses you currently offer. What is the future for ICAR? Are you going to expand the number of courses? I don't know if you're the primary instructor or early instructor or maybe one of several. Are they going to add the number of instructors? Are they going to add the number of courses for ADOS and EV? What does the future hold? Yeah, so I, I'm one of the instructors. We have two other instructors here that are doing the hands-on training. Um, you know, we're... ICAR is always looking at ways to expand and, and, and increase our, you know, our, our, our availability for the industry. Uh, we have right now, I believe there's about 14 online courses that, that people can take in, in the, you know, in the prerequisites they can take before they come in. And then we have the two hands-on courses here, the static and the dynamic. Um, there, there's always, there's always room for more classes and, and, and there's, a, you know, always a lot of things in, in the pipeline happening in, in terms of, uh, of what's happening, but I'm sure in the future there will be, more hands-on skills development classes offered. There's there's such a huge demand uh, for good, relevant teaching, uh, especially, like I said, it's now we're starting to see these systems really become mainstream uh, with, with law starting to require some of these things uh, more and more and, and more of a standardization of, 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 of ADOS. Uh, it's only going to be ever increasing. Kurt, you mentioned online classes and then obviously in-person classes. What's more popular right now? I would imagine online because it's easily more easily accessible. 
but um, and I would I would imagine you probably encourage people if they can to do it in person. What is your what is your philosophy on online versus in person? Oh, that's tough. <laughs> you know, as a as a hands on instructor, right? Uh, of course, I'm going to be a little bit biased, but it I, I uh, you got to have both. You can't have one without the other. I, I definitely see the need for the online training. You know, there's a, there's a lot of that content that you can work on your own pace and go through it self guided and, and and just do it you know after hours so you're not you're not leaving work and, and leaving them without a technician. Uh, you can work on those at lunch breaks wherever they however they may have that figured out on their end. Uh, there's a lot of that content that that's easily done online. The calibration stuff where you're physically laying out the grid and placing targets and performing the calibrations. The only way to really assess that and help someone is to be with them hands on and to be with them in person. So, um, you know, I, I there's a need for both. There's there's not need for, you know, is there one better than the other? The online stuff is more convenient. Yes, but uh, to a to a certain point. And then when you need to get to that hands on that that more, you know, that hands on skill development, you really need to be in person for that. So realistically, there's a need for both. And I see the benefit of having both. And uh, I love that we have that availability. So it's more convenient for those technicians and companies that are utilizing it. Great. Well, Kurt, I, I can't thank you enough for being on the podcast today. I mean, what you and ICAR are doing is incredible. Um, this industry has such a demand and thirst for ADAS knowledge right now. And it's yeah. just going to increase with the number of vehicles rolling off assembly lines with this technology. Uh, we could probably clone you a million times <laughs> over and still have a not enough teachers, right? But so I really yeah. thank you for giving us the time today. Absolutely. I and I, I appreciate you having me on the uh, on the podcast, and um, it's truly really humbling to be on here and being asked all these questions. So I, I appreciate everyone else's time and um, being able to hopefully educate some other people in the industry. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, no problem. I'm Jason Stahl. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching this episode of Under the Radar. For more episodes, visit BodyShopBusiness.com.